What if I told you that Russia is fake to the bone? That there is nothing original there, not even its name? Consider this. What does Russia actually produce right now? Maybe your laptop? No. A decent car you'd want to drive? No. Maybe at least an app on your phone? No. They produce nothing of value other than being a natural resource exporter. In 2015, John McCain said, uh, Russia, Russia is, is a gas, gas station masquerading as a country. country. Well, he's spot on. Russia is one big masquerade, the same way as their army was masquerading to be the second strongest in the world. As someone who knows Russian and has seen through all of their lies, in this video, I'm going to dive deep and try to open your eyes on what Moscovia really is. <laughs> So let me start with something you might already know about Russia. Vodka is a great example. Everybody thinks that vodka was invented by Russians, but in reality, it was invented by Poles. The first written mention of the drink and the word vodka was in 1405 from the Sadomids in Poland. The Polish word vodka meant chemical compounds such as medicines and cosmetics. The first written mention of vodka in the Cyrillic alphabet appears over a century later in 1533 about a medicinal drink bought from Poland to Moscovia. There is, however, a legend about Russian monk Isidore who invented vodka earlier. But this legend was likely created deliberately to appropriate the drink to Russia's cultural heritage. You probably know this famous Russian doll called Matryoshka or Russian nesting doll. It's a national symbol and it's sold in every Russian souvenir store. So if, God forbid, you've been to Russia, you have seen them everywhere. The creator of this doll is considered to be Russian Sergei Malutin, who supposedly invented it in 1890, right about the time that Russians started evolved with Japanese. Malutin stole this idea of nested dolls from a Japanese doll representing the seven lucky gods from the Japanese mythology. The outermost doll, the Fukurujuku, the god of happiness, he nested the other six gods within him. This doll predates the Russian one by centuries. Japanese, in return, have borrowed this idea from the Chinese. And see, the issue here is not that the idea was borrowed, it's that the Russians are claiming it's theirs to begin with, as they made the Japanese doll to be a national symbol and immediately enforced that in the 1900 Paris Exposition, as it was a Russian invention. And it worked. Few know that Russians stole it. Moving on, when thinking about Russian inventions, at some point one will inevitably mention the AK-47 Kalashnikov, the most famous and versatile assault rifle in the world. As you probably guess, Russians had nothing to do with it. They appropriated the German-invented STG-44 and slapped the Kalashnikov brand on it. STG-44 was designed by Nazi German Hugo Schmeisser in 1943. That very same year, Russians got their hands on this weapon and were amazed by its versatility and lethality, but couldn't reverse engineer it. After World War II, Russians captured Hugo Meister and brought him along with a team of German engineers to the Russian city of Izhevsk, where they actually improved the STG-44 and designed now well-known Russian AK-47. Guess who else worked in Izhevsk with Hugo Schmeisser? That's right, the Kalashnikov. And while on this topic, I want to tell you about a funny incident that occurred in 2017. Because of the visual similarity of AK-47 and STG-44, a sculptor accidentally placed the STG on a monument to Kalashnikov in Moscow. Later, they were forced to remove it. So, the AK-47 is not a Russian invention. It's German. On the topic of captured German engineers working for the USSR, what do you think made the Russian rocket program so successful? That's right complete and total absorption of the German rocket program and their scientists. And not just few scientists, a whole team of 170 German scientists led by Helmut Grotrup, the leading rocket engineer in Nazi Germany. The very first Russian rockets tested in 1947 were identical to German V2s, which later they rebranded as R1. So all of the following rockets made by Russians afterwards, including the famous Soyuz, aka the R7 that flies today, all of them are basically modified and improved the German V2 rocket. Russians constructed an impressive monument to the conquerors of space with the German V2 rocket at its pinnacle. Or oh, I meant the R1 rocket. By the way, over a thousands of V2s were used to bomb Britain and killed nearly 6,000 people during World War II. 
So basically, Russians erected a monument to Hitler's retaliation weapon. And it gets better. The head of Soviet rocket program, who oversaw those German engineers and who put the first man in space, was a Ukrainian man, Sergei Korolev, or rather Korolev. See, Korolev is a Russian surname, and Korolev is a Ukrainian one. Sergei was forced to russify his last name as it was a common practice back then. Also another Ukrainian scientist, Valentin Glushko, who made a significant input to Russian space program. But do those Ukrainians get any credit for Russian space achievements? Russians have made a poll stamp with Glushko and slapped the Russian name right onto it. It's a little detail, but it serves to show that they don't just steal, they pretend like it's theirs to begin with. Also, important remark, both Korolev and Glushko were imprisoned in late 30s and then released on the condition of cooperation. Russians often use their space achievements for propaganda purposes. And it worked. Everybody recognizes the great Russian's achievements in space. But how many of those are actually Russian? And how much of it is a propagandistic lie? Come to think of it, if they are so great, why did Russians lose in the space race and have zero achievements in space for the last few decades. Like the US has, just to name a few, Mars rover Curiosity and Perseverance, with the first ever drone on another planet, the biggest telescopes in space, James Webb and Hubble, or the Elon Musk's SpaceX as the most obvious example. China is catching up too. So where did all the great Russian achievements in space go? Well, maybe the renowned of scientists the work of which they can appropriate. Another thing that Russians stole, and this is much more common knowledge, they stole a nuclear program from the US. Theodore Hall, the American scientist who worked in the Manhattan Project, gave Russians a detailed description of the fat man and instructions of how to weaponize plutonium. Then in Russia, a team of, and I kid you not, a team of nearly 300 German scientists led by Manfield von Adrenne, were involved in developing the first Russian nuke. Among them, German Peter Thiessen helped enrich Russian uranium, and Austrian Gernot Zippe invented a centrifuge for isolating uranium isotopes. All of Russian nuclear program. All of it would not be possible without Americans and Germans. It's actually a bit funny to read Manfield von Adrenne was awarded a Stalin Prize. Peter Adolf Thiessen was awarded a Stalin Prize very communist Russian names. Overall, after the war, Russians have moved over 5,000 factories from Germany, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Poland. So you can imagine the scale of technology copying that took place. Everything you can imagine was copied. Cars, like this Moskvich, was an exact copy of this German Opel. Their famous Lada is a copy of this Italian Fiat. Volga, Ford Mainline. Military tech of all kinds was copied. For example, this Soviet bomber 24 is bolt-to-bolt -bolt identical copy to the American B-29. Weapons of all types were copied. Household items, beard trimmers, vacuum cleaners, photo cameras, and even children's toys. But they were copying tech even before the war. Just to name a few examples, the first Russian mass-produced car, Gas A, is an identical licensed copy of the American Ford A. They also copied Ford Model B, Buick 32, and so on, and so on, and so on. Actually, Ford Motors had supplied all the heavy machinery tools for Russians to build their cars, and another American company from Detroit, Albert Kahn Inc has provided architectural designs for the assembly plant. In fact, all of Russian industrialization was done by foreign companies. This very architectural company from Detroit I just mentioned, it had over 500 contracts with the USSR. Albert Kant Inc. had an office in Moscow and were called Gosprekstroy as a cover-up, because you know, it was supposed to look like a communism. Magnitorsk Iron Steelworks factory in Russia was an exact copy of the Iron Steelworks in Gary, Indiana, designed by Arthur G. McKee and Company. The biggest hydropower station in USSR, Dnipro Gas, was made possible thanks to a team of American engineers led by Hugh Cooper, constructed with the help of Newport News Shipbuilding and the turbines for it were provided by General Electric. The bearing factory near Moscow was constructed by Italian RIV. German company Siemens and Demag was supplying modern technologies, 
such as phones, engines, tools, etc., etc. Overall, Russia during industrialization had contracts with over 170 foreign companies, most of which were from the US and Germany. Russia wasn't just copying technology, it copied culture, songs, and even heroic deeds. For example, during World War II, they appropriated this heroic deed of B-17 bomber called All America, the crew of which survived the kamikaze rams of Nazi pilots and managed to fly home and land a severely damaged plane. It was an incredible feat how they managed to pull it off, looking at all the photos of the damage. There was a song born out of this heroic deed, named Coming In On A Wing And A Prayer. So yeah, Russians stole the song and they did with it. And since the USSR was an atheist country, they just changed the prayer part to the honest word. Google translates it as a parole. Russians have appropriated or created a lot of heroic deeds. To name a few, the heroism of Alexander Matrosov, who supposedly covered a platoon from a machine gun fire with his body, turned out to be fake. The pantil of 28 guardsmen who supposedly stopped 50 German tanks turned out to be fake. The deed of the pilot by the name of Gestalo, who rammed his burning plane into the tanks, turned out to be fake too. And so on and so on and so on. So you gotta understand those were huge and empire-wide deeds. They were massively used by propaganda. There are tons of monuments to them, post stamps, and even movies were made after them. That's a bit eerie to think that it's all fake though. So by now, you are starting to see the pattern of just how fake Russia is, and this gas station masquerading as a country continues with their whole national identity, their name, flag, and coat of arms, all stolen or copied. Let's start with the name, Russia. The name is stolen from Ukraine. It's a huge topic that deserves a whole separate episode, but I'm gonna try to explain it with super oversimplification. Over a thousand years ago, in the territory of modern Ukraine was a state called Rus, with the capital in Kyiv, hence it's called Kievan Rus. It was a mighty and prosperous state that was on par with the Byzantine Empire. In 1240, most of Rus was destroyed by Mongol Tatars, the Golden Horde. A couple decades later, after the destruction in the far reaches of no longer existing Rus, a new Moscow duchy is born that was a vassal to the Golden Horde. The duchy quickly expanded, acquiring new and new territories, including some of the territories of no longer existing Rus. At some point, the duchy grew into Moscovic Kingdom or Tsardom, until 1721, Peter I artificially changed its name to Russian Empire. Here, a history professor of Yale confirmed this. The, the new Russian Empire, as it's called from 1721, and a very, by the way, Russian Empire is a conscious rebranding exercise, right? It's called Russia because of Rus, not the, not the other way around. Now, Rus is a Slavic name. If you translate it, for example, to French, it would be Russie. If you would translate it to Italian, it would be Russia. And bingo. In English, it's Russia. all familiar to us as the name Russia which is just a Rus translated from Latin. A post-Mongol state with no history before that, no recognition from the rest of the world, appropriates the name of Kievan Rus so that they could claim to be the successor to the once prosperous state. This gave Moscovy, albeit fake, the image of a cultured, civilized state with a long historical tradition, with the Byzantine key of church traditions, and gave them a right to claim the territories of fallen Rus, including its capital, Kyiv. And as you see, they're trying to lay claim to Kyiv to this very day. I'll give you one example of what they write in their propaganda bulletins. Kyiv, without the great Russia and separate from Russia, is unthinkable in any shape or form. This propaganda bulletin was just recently found in the abandoned military Russian positions. I think that's actually one of the biggest reasons why Moscovites are attacking the real successor to Rus now. Just look at how ridiculous their excuses for invasions are. They claim Ukrainians are neo-Nazis, that we have biolaboratories that could send infected geese to Moscow. They claim they wanted to prevent NATO expansions, but when Finland and Sweden joined, they didn't care, etc., etc. 
Of course they had to come up with all those ridiculous excuses for the invasion. They can't really just say that they have appropriated the brand of Kievan Rus. While researching this question, I've analyzed dozens of old maps. And indeed, prior 1721, in place of modern-day Russia, there is printed the name Moscovia, while the word Russia is in the place of modern-day Ukraine, especially Western Ukraine, as that part of Rus survived the Mongol invasion and existed for another century until it was absorbed by Lithuanians. I'll give you a couple examples from those maps. Let's look at the map from 1648 by French cartographer Juliana de Beauplan. The north and south are reversed here, so the map is upside down from what we are used to today. It's named the General Map of Wild Fields, aka Ukraine. Supposedly, during the times of Kievan Rus, Ukraine was the name of the territories on the south that was in between the Islamic and Christian worlds. Anyway, immediately to the left we see Chernobyl, then my hometown Chernihiv, then if we scroll up we can make out Kiev, and if we move to the left, where modern-day Russia is, we see Magni Dukatus Moscoviae Pars, which means the Grand Duchy of Muscovy Land. Right, I don't see any Russia label here. But what's interesting, if we move the furthest away from Muscovia to the very western border, we see the Ukrainian city of Lviv and big fat letters of Russia lands. Russia, which translates from French to Rus. Another good example is a German map of 1720, just a year before Moscovia's rebranding. It's called Vkraina, the land of Cossacks. In the place of modern-day Russia, we also see Moscovitica and also see Tartaria. And this is very accurate. The Moscovia was still a vassal to Tatars. Then to the west, we see labels Russia Rubra and Ukraine running in parallel. What a great historical evidence this is. Russia Rubra means Red Rus, the part that survived the Horde invasion. There is also the White Rus in the north, which is now Belarus. To me, this is a fascinating topic. I've spent hours looking at those maps. Let me know in the comments if you'd like a separate video in which I'd go into more details of how exactly Moscovia appropriated the name of Kievan Rus. Also, I'll leave a link to this map project so you can explore all the maps if you wish. Let's move on to the flag, and this is probably the least fascinating story. They have a white, blue, red flag, and they basically copy those colors from the Dutch red, white, blue, who were building their ships. This happened in the 18th century, about the same time of the rebranding Moscovy to the Russian Empire. Rumor says these were the only colors Dutch builders could supply for the flag, so Moscovites just rearranged them, and voila, Russian flag. Russian coat of arms, the double-headed eagle, is copied from the Byzantine Empire a couple decades later after its fall in the 15th century. This way, Moscovites directly proclaimed themselves as a successor to the Byzantine heritage and launched this political concept of Moscow being the third Rome that is active in the heads of Russians to this very day. To solidify this claim even further, the Moscovy Tsar Ivan III married a niece of the last Byzantine emperor. I'll link a Wikipedia article about this too. So why are they trying so hard to be someone's successor? I think this is because they want to be recognized and respected in the European world, but feel like they don't deserve it because there is this newborn European nation coming from Asian Mongol heritage and being the vassal to the Golden Horde for five centuries doesn't help them gain this respect. So instead of embracing it, they're copying and stealing all the cultures, histories and achievements. And this is true to the present day, as you may conclude from this video. They are full of exaggerated grandeur, constantly comparing themselves to Americans. Oh, and by the way, before I segue into the next topic, the fortress in the center of Moscow, that is called the Kremlin, was designed by Italian architects. And to add pain to injury, the Kremlin closely resembles the Sforenza Fortress in Milan that was constructed just 50 years earlier. The similarities are not so apparent if you look at them side by side, and that's because Kremlin had lots of capital renovations done to it since when it was built. Also, while being in Moscow, Italians constructed many Russian cathedrals. 
It's unknown who is the architect of their most famous cathedral, the Saint Basil, but it's very likely they were also Italians. In this section, I want to talk about the current day and how literally centuries of stealing, copying and imitating has affected Russia. Naturally, those traditions being there since the inception of the Moscow state did not disappear and continue to this day. These traditions show themselves not just by stealing washing machines and looting from Ukrainian homes or Chechen homes or German homes. Moscovites are still trying to appropriate Ukrainian culture. One example of it being how they're trying to claim that borscht is a Russian traditional cuisine. Here's a tweet example. What's fascinating is how this Russian government-led Twitter account managed to attach borscht to the ancient Rus. So in a way, giving them another excuse to repeat and reinforce their centuries-old lie, which unfortunately works. In Thailand, I've seen a menu with a dish labeled Russian borscht. I mean, it's like seeing German croissant or French pasta. By the way, that restaurant was led by Russians. This time, however, Ukrainians, the real Ruthenians, have a state and are capable of fighting back. UNESCO recently recognized borscht as a Ukrainian cultural heritage. So from the recent past, there is this hilarious example of how their national news program copied an opening scene from, and you'll never guess it, from a Robocop movie. Here, watch them side by side. Как по мне, так свобода слова – это когда называешь вещи своими именами. Я Дмитрий Киселев, и это «Вести недели». Хватит мямлить, пора говорить, как есть. Yeah, so this anchor named Dmitry Kiselev, he's the Kremlin's primal propagandist. Between his two minutes of hate towards the West and glorification of Big Brother, he also discusses the size of Trump's penis, penis у Трампа, цитата, меньше среднего. and the chest hair of Zelensky. Войну со своими волосами на груди. Yeah, I did not make it up. At some point I want to make an episode about how ridiculously cringe painful Russian propaganda is. It's also bizarre just how fake Russian propaganda gets from presenting a video game as a real event to hiring actors that would pretend to be eyewitnesses of how the Ukrainian army crucified a child. Speaking about actors, Putin constantly surrounds himself with them. They are supposed to imitate people from the masses. And it's also worth mentioning the recent montage of how Putin pretended to be in the room, but we see the signs of a green screen and we see how his hand is moving through a microphone. Or a similar case where he was meeting with those mothers of Russian soldiers. On the white shot, we could see his head was attached to a body afterwards. And in the close shot, we see that a chair next to him is empty, meaning that the real Putin was never there. And I'm not even gonna elaborate on the fact that those were not even real moms, just bogus women. Russia is just one big cringy imitation. Fake to the bone. As I came to see it, Putin is their natural and inevitable ruler. Of course, there is space to debate this argument, but I think there couldn't have been any other form of government on this territory with such traditions. Russia produces nothing original, and whatever they do end up producing, nobody needs. Like they made this passenger jet, Suhoi Superjet, which is actually 70% of foreign components, it had so many flaws and fatal accidents that not even Russians that are accustomed to low standards of living want to fly it. The only thing Moscovites are good at is propaganda. And I see its effects on people, even in America. It reaches and corrupts minds. I actually don't believe there is such a nationality as Russian. It's too broad, from Islamic Chechens to Buddhist Buddhists to shamanic Eskimos, to orthodox Finn people. I think saying Russian is like saying Ottoman or Roman or Persian. These are not nationalities. These are citizens of the corresponding empires. There are Turks, there are Italians, 
there are Iranians, and then there are Moscovites. That's who they really are. Light always wins. Empires always fall. These rules are absolute. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing, sharing this video if you enjoyed it, and I'd love to hear your opinion about this, so please do leave a comment. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and until next time.